Hello, everyone. My name is Gemma Rakelian. I'm the CEO of the Institute of Cancer and Crisis, and you are watching Cancer and Crisis Talks on Onco Daily. Today, my guest is Dr. Nazi Hamad. Hello, Dr. Hamad. Hi. Uh, hello. Nice to see you again. Uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here today with us. Dr. Nazi Hamad is a Sudanese-Canadian professor of medical oncology at the University of Toronto. Her academic work and research interests include medical education and workforce development in low- and middle-income countries, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. Other research and academic interests include value-based cancer care, global and local inequities in disparities in cancer, global health and global oncology, and cancer in conflict zones. Together with colleagues in Africa, she led the first Choosing Wisely Africa initiative. She's a co-author in the Lancet Oncology Commission for Cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa and is a commissioner in the Lancet Commission on Women, Power and Cancer. Dr. Hamad, I believe today our discussion will be mainly about situation in Sudan and cancer care in Sudan. You know, I remember in your speech at the Global Summit on War and Cancer, you mentioned that uh, Sudan is considered as a hub of cancer care. Can you tell us more about current state of cancer care in Sudan? So uh, before the, the war uh, or the conflict uh, broke out in April, actually April 15, uh, 2023, so as soon it's going to be a year. And during that year, a lot has happened in terms of massive displacement, massive destruction of infrastructure, uh, of, of, of uh, healthcare and other types of infrastructure such as transportation. There has been significant loss of life and uh, cancer uh, care was also a, casual, uh, a casualty of this uh, conflict. So uh, we know that Sudan had um, at least three uh, functioning um, machines, uh, radiotherapy machines. There was uh, the uh, the center um, in Khartoum is one of the biggest centers and oldest centers uh, in, in, in Africa, and I would say in the continent as a whole. And uh, there were uh, several peripheral um, cancer centers in the uh, provinces that were also uh, receiving patients from outside Sudan as well. So the epicenter of the uh, conflict was in Khartoum. And since April uh, last year, that uh, center where uh, there's radiotherapy, chemotherapy, as well as uh, other centers in Khartoum that have specialized cancer surgery, they've all stopped uh, working. And uh, patients uh, and uh, physicians uh, had to leave the capital. Some of them uh, left the country, but most of the um, patients had been displaced to other uh, cancer centers in the periphery. And then, as of uh, recently, in in, um, uh, in December, the uh, other big cancer center, which is in uh, Jazeera and Medellin, uh, that has also uh, fallen uh, under the uh, rapid support. Uh, uh, forces um, uh, control, and uh, we would say uh, most of the operations there have, um, uh, you know, stopped. And other uh, radiotherapy machines in the country have either stopped working because uh, there is no uh, way to um, fix uh, the machine or uh, provide the regular maintenance. Uh, patients have to travel very long distances to uh, get to, to where they are. There's been uh, difficulty in uh, accruing uh, medicines, uh, which usually uh, they were distributed uh, from Khartoum. And then, of course, uh, especially pain medications. And uh, Sudan will used to be one of the countries that has um, very good uh, childhood cancer care. And uh, that has um, now uh, is now provided in only one or two uh, centers and the patients, uh, you have to remember Sudan is a very big uh, country. So most of the patients are unable to get there because uh, there is uh, now a center in Marawi. Uh, throughout this, uh, the uh, oncologists and the other healthcare professionals have tried very hard to maintain as much as possible um, some uh, level of care as uh, either virtually or in person, but there's also uh, the uh, challenge uh, the fact that uh, the internet is not working well or um, only, um, uh, you know, only 
through uh, WhatsApp where you can uh, maintain contact. That's how the, uh, those of us who are outside were able to maintain uh, contact with those uh, who are inside. Uh, the workforce had many challenges, including the no lack of salaries, um, and, you know, threat of physical violence, uh, the uh, destruction of the uh, infrastructure, uh, the risk of displacement, uh, whether to the um, uh, outs inside the country or outside uh, the country. So all in all, uh, this has been a catastrophe, not only for Sudan, but for surrounding regions, mainly because Sudan itself is surrounded by an area where there, by several countries where there is either no cancer care or very little cancer care, starting from Eritrea, South Sudan, to um, uh, you know, Central Africa Republic and, and Chad, and the uh, eastern part uh, of Ethiopia. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, let's move to my next question. I want to understand how has the crisis affected the training and availability of oncology professionals in Sudan? You mentioned before that there is a shortage now and how the government health system deals with that. Uh, so uh, one thing about Sudan is that it's one of the um, first sub-Saharan uh, African countries that actually had local training. It started in the 90s and it reduced um, clin uh, clinical oncologists, uh, physicians who gave both um, uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy. Uh, in addition, Sudan has, um, you know, physicists and uh, nursing uh, nurses and, and radiation therapists. Um, so, in terms of the uh, physician workforce, which is oncologist, um, the, uh, the the local training is really uh, it's it's a very good example that local training is the best way to um, to produce a competent, locally relevant uh, workforce. And so uh, by, uh, you know, the late, uh, by 2020s, and I had uh, more than 60 oncologists. You have to remember there are some countries in Africa that have only like one or two oncologists in the country. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so uh, it was a robust uh, training uh, programs uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, people like us who are in the diaspora participated in it. Uh, what happened after the um, uh, conflict is that, uh, of course, uh, the there was severe disruption of the training. Uh, some uh, attempts by the Sudan Medical Specialization Board is to, uh, at least those who are about to graduate, get some of their uh, exams done, maybe in Egypt or elsewhere. Uh, but the issue is really going forward. Uh, there will be a, a disruption of the pipeline how to produce future oncologists, that will be a real uh, challenge and uh, replace the one who are uh, you know, now leaving the country because there's a significant brain drain. And so uh, this, we will, we will see that most, uh, this challenge will become more apparent, although right now it's quite uh, clear, but will be uh, a challenge in the recovery period if when peace and I hope peace comes very soon, but we don't know uh, how long that will take, but uh, it will be a, a big uh, challenge as well. And that's something uh, in the international community, we need to look at how do we um, absorb uh, you know, like, uh, neighboring countries that have uh, training programs, the nearest is, is Ethiopia and Egypt both have them. So can they absorb some of the um, uh, trainees? Can uh, Sudanese continue to train there so that uh, when the peace uh, is back, uh, the, uh, then uh, they can, uh, some of them can come back and and start, uh, you know, re rebuilding uh, the cancer care in Sudan. These are several challenges. Uh, one thing that uh, people are trying to do is is to at least maintain the online version, see if uh, people can go to nearby universities. But even that with the internet, not well, we've seen that in the Ukraine and other places, but the internet does not even support Zoom uh, in Sudan right now. Uh, so we are looking at that uh, now, and uh, it's not only for oncology, but for all other um, you know, specialities, especially the ones that deal with non-communicable diseases, such as you know, nephrology, uh, cardiology, and the others. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hamad, can you please uh, tell us more about the financial barriers as well, like uh, to accessing cancer care in Sudan, and how has the crisis influenced these barriers? 
Um, Sudan, uh, for, for, for cancer care, there has been some degree of universal health coverage, uh, which is really uh, something much more um, advanced than uh, in the surrounding region. So patients uh, will get um, chemotherapy, uh, most chemotherapy, not all free of charge, uh, reduced, um, you know, spending for uh, out-of-pocket expenditure for radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, however, having said that, uh, diagnostics, uh, most patients would have to pay out-of-pocket travel and, mm -hmm. uh, and other expenses um, for care, uh, caregivers having to take off work and all of that. So just like other uh, LMIC, uh, there's a significant financial toxicity, even when the government is, um, you know, helping some. Now, after the uh, after this conflict started, uh, things are getting worse. Uh, first of all, uh, for the patients displaced, travel is very expensive. Uh, it's fraught with uh, dangers. And, uh, and to give you an example, the only um, radiotherapy machine that's functioning now in the country in, in Marawi is actually privately owned. So all the public um, radiotherapy machine where the mm -hmm. were free of that are now uh, non-functional. Uh, as mm -hmm. such, uh, I would say uh, it's for some patient, it's almost impossible. There has been some attempts, uh, for, for example, in Mary to build uh, or to, uh, to create some um, uh, guest houses, and uh, for, especially for children uh, with cancer. There's been some uh, uh, money donated by uh, Sudanese in the diaspora. Uh, and so that helped mitigate some of it. Uh, but I would say uh, a lot of patients are now without, completely without uh, access because of the expense of travel, the expense of the therapy itself, if even when uh, it's available. And of course, those who are lucky enough to be able to go to Egypt and elsewhere have to pay out of pocket, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to make sure that those who are become refugees uh, elsewhere, um, you know, through United Nations and other uh, ways will be able to, um, uh, you know, avert the catastrophic expenditure that is caused uh, by cancer care. Dr. Hamad, I like to give this question to all my guests. So what is the role of international community in these kind of situations? So uh, the, we have seen the role of the international community in other conflicts, such as Ukraine, the ones in, in Syria and, 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 and currently in Palestine. Uh, however, when it comes to conflicts in Africa, there has been several challenges. Uh, one mm -hmm. of them is that um, there's been little engagement from the uh, international community. Part of it is uh, because uh, traditionally most of the conflicts occurred in places where there was no cancer care. And also uh, there is this uh, sort of normalization of uh, um, conflicts in Africa. It's like, okay, this, there's always conflicts in Africa. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the currently it's estimated that there are about uh, 40 to 50 million displaced people in Africa. And this is, uh, you know, uh, almost the, um, the population of, uh, uh, you know, many countries uh, in the world. And these patients and these uh, displaced people do have uh, cancer care needs. Uh, a lot of them are contrary to the uh, belief that they all run in, in uh, to Europe and, and those uh, ships, um, that uh, dangerous journeys crossing the Mediterranean, that actually um, most of the people are displaced are inside uh, Africa. So um, if, when it comes to Sudan, I think Sudan is probably the first conflict that there's been some attention Part of it is because of um, the uh, role of uh, you know, Sudanese uh, 
colleges inside and outside the, the country in bringing that. So uh, we had, uh, you know, had a chance to, we had a chance to participate in this, in, in your summit. Uh, we um, presented at some WHO meetings. We um, had some publications in the, in, in the Lancet, in uh, eCancer and in ASCO Connections. And we are very grateful to, for that. There has been some solidarity from our um, uh, colleagues and, and, and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, However, this really falls short uh, uh, of any coordinated real effort to address uh, the issue. There's a sense of uh, helplessness and hopelessness and, and not knowing how to, um, uh, to actually uh, provide uh, um, solidarity and assistance. And also uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, African conflicts a low priority in terms of uh, you know, what will happen to cancer patients uh, or uh, patients with non-communicable diseases in general, not uh, only cancer. So I would say that we have not seen the concerted effort to airlift our uh, children with cancer that we have seen in other places. This did not happen in Sudan. And so we are seeing uh, children with uh, ALL relapsing uh, now. Uh, we have not seen any... Um, a concerted effort to help bring uh, medications to the routes that are actually a little bit functioning, like Port Sudan on the Red Sea. And um, it, and it's just not the international community. We also, uh, at the African level, uh, we yet uh, to come uh, together and address the cancer needs of all of those uh, uh, patients who are internally displaced. There are about 16 countries now in Africa that have uh, conflicts, and we are trying to address uh, that situation uh, currently. But I would say, um, in a nutshell, that the uh, international community response has been uh, suboptimal and to some extent uh, disappointing, especially when compared to other parts, uh, other conflicts in the world. So to conclude our fruitful discussion today, uh, Dr. Ahmad, I want to hear your opinion about the long-term projections for cancer care in Sudan, if a crisis continues and how uh, do you see now the solution to the situation? Uh, so if the, in Sudan, if the crisis uh, continues, I, I, I think we really need to, uh, there has been some uh, attempts to get some uh, medicines and, and uh, some of these attempts have succeeded. So we just need to uh, have the international community come and, uh, and most of these solutions are homegrown. And when I say homegrown, that means uh, people from inside and, and, and the contribution of the diaspora. The Sudanese diaspora. So I think the I think the in uh, the national community uh, needs to engage with the with this with these homegrown solutions and see if they can uh, support, uh, especially in terms of uh, medicines. Uh, it's still not clear how uh, they would be they would help with the maintenance of the radiation. Uh, machines uh, and that, but we need to come with some uh, creative uh, solutions uh, for that. Support um, family uh, families inside uh, that are uh, you know uh, having uh, who have cancer patients and on those who are displaced to neighboring countries. We need to support those neighboring countries because there's a lot of burden on them on these countries to receive. Um, uh, refugees and uh, also their health systems are fragile and stretched so we need to work with other uh, neighboring countries so for example south sudan now we see there are attempts to build uh, oncology uh, care and it's actually uh, most of it it will be um some some most of it is by the displaced uh, you know health workforce itself so those attempts uh, should be supported because they not will not only um benefit uh those who are displaced uh, from the north but it will also benefit uh, the local uh, population in, in south sudan where uh, cancer care has not um uh, you know, is still uh, lagging behind uh, significantly, and then in the uh, and and then in the long term, we need to really think strategically about how 
uh, about the cause of these uh, conflicts, how an even development, uh, climate uh, change, and equal trade agreements, um, uh, the um, interest in, uh, in African resources uh, without, uh, you know, really paying attention to how the local populations uh, benefit uh, from this, in addition to the lack of democracy, lack of uh, gender equality, all the, the, the causes, that, the reasons that um, makes areas prone to conflict. Uh, so if you look at the Sahel region and all the 16 countries uh, that have uh, conflicts in them in Africa, they share similar um uh, you know, uh, similar, um, you know, uh, health systems, um, similar structures of governance. And um, our message should be uh, with, you know, the collaboration internationally in the African Union is that really uh, it's, a peace is essential for health. So one of the reasons that uh, certain uh, population uh, take up arms or segments of the population take uh, up arms is that they have no access to uh, health, uh, education, and all the requirements uh, for, for peace. Uh, and so we need to think uh, to change our way of thinking. We also uh, need to, to um, you know, partnership, we need to change the way we think of uh, partnerships is concentrated on certain countries, while some, some countries are totally forgotten or, or, or off uh, the map. Because as we have seen in Sudan, the, if, when the whole region becomes destabilized, even areas that are hubs for cancer care, are become indigenous of self. So the entire region, even places that seems to, the suddenness of the uh, conflict in Sudan has alerted us to that. So even areas that seems to be stable and becoming prosperous cannot really um, hope to maintain the, that without uh, uh, peace and prosperity in the whole uh, region as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamad. It was an absolute pleasure having you today. And your take home message is for our audience today that peace is like a basic need for health, right? For maintaining healthy population and cancer care. Health is a basic uh, requirement. Uh, health actually will give us uh, peace. So we need to make sure that uh, there is health care for all, you know, whatever yeah. part of the world uh, there are. Yeah, and thank you so much for providing me this opportunity.